K2 is truly a mountain of epic proportions. Its towering height and reputation as a savage mountain strikes fear in the hearts of even the bravest of mountaineers. The mere thought of attempting to conquer this peak is enough to give me chills. Now, just think about the mountaineers who try to conquer this majestic peak. No wonder K2 can take your life if you are unlucky. Today, I'll take you through such an unfortunate incident, the 1995 K2 disaster. So stay tuned and don't miss the ending. The conditions on K2 sound like an absolute nightmare. The combination of freezing temperatures, volatile weather systems, and extreme high altitude climbing is enough to push any climber to their limits. And let's not forget about the difficult and steep technical sections that must be overcome. It's enough to make my head spin. It's no wonder that summiting K2 is considered the ultimate accomplishment among mountaineers. The very thought of standing at the summit, looking out over the world from such a height, is awe-inspiring. But with such a fearsome reputation and a staggering number of fatalities, only the most experienced and hardened climbers would dare to attempt such a feat. It's a sobering thought that 95 mountaineers have lost their lives on K2's treacherous slopes. It just goes to show how unforgiving and brutal this mountain can be. But for those who are brave enough to try, summoning K2 is the ultimate test of skill, courage, and endurance. The history of K2 is filled with tragedy and heartbreak, and the summer climbing season of 1995 was no exception. Despite the foul weather that battered the mountain, several teams were preparing for their summit bids, each hoping to conquer the savage mountain and make history. One of the most notable climbers that year was Alison Hargraves, a professional mountaineer from the UK. Fresh off a successful ascent of the north ridge of Mount Everest without the use of supplemental oxygen, she was a force to be reckoned with. Teaming up with an American team led by Rob Slater, she was determined to make it to the top of K2. As they prepared for their summit bid along with Abruzzi Spur, the climbers knew that the odds were stacked against them, but they were willing to take the risk to push themselves to their limits and test their skills and endurance against the treacherous mountain. Little did they know, tragedy was waiting just around the corner. Despite their best efforts, a sudden and unexpected storm swept across the mountain, catching the climbers off guard and leaving them stranded in the death zone. One by one, they succumbed to the elements and their dreams of summoning K2 forever shattered. The loss of 11 climbers on that fateful day in 2008 is well known, but the disaster of 1995 is a poignant reminder of the dangers and risks that come with climbing such a formidable peak. It's a reminder that even the most skilled and experienced climbers can fall victim to the savage mountain and that sometimes, no matter how prepared we are, nature has the final say. Despite the unfavorable weather conditions and the disappointment of not being able to reach the summit, the team managed to climb up to Camp 4 at a staggering height of 7,850 meters. They had even ventured further up into the death zone at 8,000 meters, which is an incredible feat in itself. However, Mother Nature had other plans and a bad weather forecast forced the team to retreat back to base camp. It must have been devastating for them to give up on their dreams of reaching the summit after coming so close. But after weeks of stormy weather, hope was on the horizon as a favorable weather forecast appeared. Allison and Rob, determined to reach the top, couldn't resist the opportunity and made the decision to try for the summit again. It is a testament to their bravery and perseverance that they decide to take on the daunting challenge once again, even with the knowledge of the dangers that lay ahead. On August 9th, the pair embarked on their journey towards the summit, leaving behind the new remaining climbers at base camp who were also hoping for a late season summit bid. It must have been an exciting and nerve wracking time for Allison and Rob, knowing that they were risking everything to achieve their dreams. As they chatted with the Spanish climbers, Allison and Rob must have felt a sense of camaraderie, of shared experience and shared goals. Climbing a mountain like K2 is no easy feat, and meeting others who have also taken on such a challenge must have been a moment of connection for them. But even as they talked, the climbers must have been aware of the risks that still lay ahead. K2 is a notoriously dangerous mountain, and the slightest misstep or change in weather can mean the difference between life and death. Despite this, Allison and Rob must have felt a sense of determination as they prepared for their summit bid the following day. 
After weeks of wading out storms and acclimatizing to the high altitude, they were finally within reach of their goal. They had come so far and were so close to the summit. Little did they know that the events of the following day would change their lives forever and they would become a tragic part of K2's deadly history. As Rob and Allison began their final push for the summit of K2, the stakes were high and the climb was sure to be grueling. They were not the only ones attempting to reach the summit from the Abruzzi camp that day, as Peter Hillary and his team joined forces with them. The group made good progress throughout the early morning hours of August 13th, but they knew that the most challenging part of their climb still lay ahead, the bottleneck. This steep, sloping portion of the mountain was shaded by a gigantic Serac, which loomed ominously above them. It was a treacherous section, and they would need to be incredibly careful as they navigated it. But despite the risks, the climbers pushed on. They were determined to make it to the top. As they approached the bottleneck, the climbers made contact with the Spanish expedition team they had agreed to rendezvous with. Working together, they began to tackle the challenge that lay ahead of them. The climb was exhausting and progress was slow, but they persevered, inching their way up the mountain. For Rob and Allison, the climb was especially meaningful. They had come so far and overcome so many obstacles to get to this point. And now, with the summit in sight, they were more determined than ever to make it to the top. But they knew that the final stretch would be the most difficult of all, and they braced themselves for the challenge to come. As per the plan they agreed upon with the Spanish expedition, the two groups of climbers met at the bottleneck. However, it seemed that the Spanish team had a bit of a head start, as they had set off for the summit at midnight, a few hours before the English-speaking climbers. Just as the climbers from both parties were about to converge near the bottleneck, a sense of uncertainty started to creep in. Peter Hillary, son of the legendary mountaineer Sir Edmund Hillary, noticed some ominous clouds approaching K2 rather quickly. The clouds were big and looked like Alta Serratus clouds, and a strong wind was blowing snow. Hillary and five others made a cautious decision to retreat back to the Spanish Camp 4 and then head back to the Abruzzi Camp 4 instead of attempting to reach the summit. It was a difficult decision for Hillary and the other climbers who had to abandon their dream of reaching the summit. Hillary later recounted what made him reconsider his summit attempt. He said, I saw everyone crossing the traverse, then they disappeared in clouds. Not long after parting ways with Hillary and the others, Jeff Flakes also decided against continuing his bid for the summit. He turned back, heading towards Camp 4 to join the others who had abandoned their summit bid. It was a tough decision for all of them as they had trained hard and come so close to achieving their goal. But the unpredictable and treacherous weather on K2 can be unforgiving, and the climbers knew they had to prioritize their safety over their ambition. As the remaining climbers and the Spanish expedition team joined forces to tackle K2, they were met with a mix of excitement and apprehension. With the summit in sight, they pressed on, but as dusk approached, tensions were high. At approximately 6.45 p.m., a ray of hope shone through the clouds as Alison Hargraves made radio contact with the Spanish Camp 4, announcing that she and Javi Olivar had reached the summit. Despite the ominous clouds that had scared away some of the climbers, the weather appeared to be holding up. Lorenzo Ortos, who had turned back earlier in the day, described the conditions he observes as exceptional. It seemed that the climbers were in for a smooth descent under the light of the full moon. However, as they neared the summit, the weather took a turn for the worse. Fierce winds, reaching 100 to 140 miles per hour, began to lash into K2 slopes. Jeff Lakes, a Canadian climber who had already retreated to the Spanish Camp 4, was the first to encounter these ferocious winds. As the sunlight began to fade, the conditions grew even more treacherous. The climbers were faced with a difficult decision. Should they continue to push on toward the summit, risking their lives in the face of such fierce winds, or should they turn back and retreat to safety? It was a moment of reckoning, and the climbers knew that their lives hung in the balance. After taking a break at Spanish Camp 4, Lake started his descent, but it didn't go smoothly. Just as he was passing the Black Pyramid, the winds hit him with full force, making it difficult to continue. Unfortunately, the winds weren't finished yet. As time passed, they grew stronger and more furious, unleashing their full fury upon the Spanish Camp 4 around 8, 
to 9 p.m. One of the Spanish team members, Pepe Garces, had decided not to summit that day and was in his tent when he realized it was starting to blow away. Luckily, Lorenzo Ortas came to the rescue, holding the tent down for just long enough for Garces to escape. But their troubles didn't end there. Forced to tear a hole in Lorenzo's tent, the men huddled inside, bracing themselves against the relentless wind. To make matters worse, Garces was unable to grab any of his gear from his tent before escaping, leaving them with only one sleeping bag to share between them. Can you imagine the bone-chilling night they must have had at such an extreme altitude, with only partial shelter and no proper gear to keep them warm? The men at the Spanish Camp 4 had a momentary relief from the unforgiving winds, but it was short-lived. By 11 p.m., the gale had ravaged their shelter and left them with nothing but blown-away tents and a single sleeping bag to cling to. The night was bone-chilling and filled with despair but nothing could prepare them for the fate that awaited their three comrades and Allison's party, who were still stranded in the death zone. They fought desperately to escape the elements, but their efforts were in vain. None of them made it out alive, and the details of their unimaginable struggle that night would never be known. The following morning, August 14th, the winds began to die down, and the badly frostbitten Jose Garces and Lorenzo Ortas emerged from their battered tents. They had somehow managed to survive the night, but they knew that the probability of anyone else surviving was next to zero. They decided to take full advantage of the lull in the storm and begin their descent down the south-southeast spur, hoping to make it to safety. It was a brave decision given the treacherous conditions, but they had no other choice. The memory of that herring night would stay with them forever as a reminder of the fragility of life in the face of nature's power. By 4 p.m. that afternoon, the pair had reached an altitude of approximately 7,400 meters when they spotted some distinct items of clothing some distance away from them on the right-hand side of their line. It was like a punch in the gut, and I felt a wave of sadness wash over me. Lorenzo, with a heavy heart, decided to go have a closer look at the items and found a boot that had a small hearing device attached to the inside. As he reached for it, his hands trembled with the realization of what he might find. And there it was, Alison Hargrave's device. The device that she had shown him and how it attached to a battery she kept inside her clothing. The night the two groups had briefly met to discuss their plans for their upcoming summit assault on the evening of the 12th. With a lump in his throat, Lorenzo recognized the device as belonging to Alison Hargrave's. He instantly knew that something terrible had happened to her. He couldn't ignore the gnawing feeling in his gut and decided to investigate further. Approximately three meters below where he found the boot, he also found her distinct coat, which was a shade of dark purple emblazoned with a pattern of petite flowers. The sight of her coat made him shiver as he realized that it was drenched in blood. Inside her coat, he also found her harness with her pyramid ascender still attached. Both items were evidence of a terrible accident that had taken place. His eyes scanned the gully above him, hoping to find any evidence of where she had fallen from. And there it was, three distinct tracks down the rocky slope originating from the summit ridge at a height of what he estimated to be approximately 8,500 meters near the traverse from the summit ridge that leads down to the bottleneck. Lorenzo knew what he had to do next. He retrieved the harness from her coat to return to her family in the UK and proceeded to make his way a bit further down the leftmost edge of the gully. It was a somber and emotional moment for him. As Lorenzo descended a little further, his heart was heavy with grief as he was able to make out the outline of a body resting on a flat surface approximately 300 meters below him. It was like a nightmare come true, and his mind raced with thoughts of Ellison and the events that had transpired over the past few days. He estimated that the body was at a similar elevation to Camp 3, which rested at 7,100 meters. The figure was wearing red clothing and Lorenzo recalled that he had seen Allison wearing red clothing beneath her outer coat. His worst fears were confirmed, and he was now convinced that he was peering down at the body of Allison below him. As he continued to peer down the gully for a short while, searching for any trace of his fellow Spaniards that had been accompanying Allison when she had called him to announce he'd reached the summit, his heart sank even further. The storm had claimed yet another life. After discussing his findings with Jose, the duo continued their descent, deciding to forego the sparsely supplied Camp 3 
and descend all the way back to Camp 2, which they reached at approximately 10 p.m. that evening. The following morning, the 15th, at approximately 8 a.m., the duo made radio contact with the remaining expedition party members over on the Abruzzi route to report their findings and exchange information about the events that had transpired over the previous few days. It was a somber and emotional moment as they shared the news of Allison's tragic accident. Their hearts heavy with grief, they learned on this radio call that the storm had claimed yet another life. Jeff Lakes, who was the first of the mountaineers to be struck by the storm on August 12th, had also lost his life. As Jeff Lakes made his way down the treacherous climbing section, the Black Diamond, it seemed like he might just make it back to Camp 2. But as he descended further, the altitude sickness hit him hard. Despite this, he pushed on for a grueling 30-hour descent in the freezing conditions, alone and exposed to the elements. Finally, on the 14th, he stumbled into Camp 2, barely able to move. His teammates from the Canadian New Zealander expedition rushed to his aid, but it was too late. Jeff was in extremely poor condition, and the storms had taken their toll on his body. He passed away in the early morning hours of August 15th. The news of Jeff's death was devastating, and it only added to the many questions surrounding the disaster. What had happened to the missing climbers? How had they met their end on that fateful longest evening? As Peter Hillary and others who had forfeited their summit bids reflected on their decision, they were reaffirmed in their belief that they had made the right choice. It was a tragic and sobering reminder of the dangers of climbing in the world's highest mountains, and a testament to the courage and resilience of those who braved these challenges. He couldn't believe it. Ten minutes after their discussion, he had made up his mind. He tried to think rationally about the situation, but his altitude sickness had left him feeling disoriented and confused. Everything seemed muddled and uncertain, and he couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As he watched the others continue upwards, he began to wonder if they knew something he didn't. Was he being irrational? He just couldn't shake the feeling that going up was the wrong decision. Then, a little voice inside him spoke up, softly and calmly. It was his intuition, and it was telling him to go down. It was a feeling that he couldn't ignore, no matter how hard he tried. In the end, he trusted his gut and made the difficult decision to turn back. It wasn't easy, but he knew it was the right choice. And looking back, he was glad he had listened to that little voice inside him. Sometimes, our intuition knows what's best, even when our minds are clouded by doubt and confusion. Survivors from the expedition team were left questioning the tragic events that unfolded on that fateful day. They couldn't help but wonder if their comrades had succumbed to the dreaded summit fever, or if they were simply unlucky victims of an unexpectedly powerful snowless windstorm. You know, the kind that usually clears the summit of that snowy haze and creates perfect climbing conditions. But then came the Pakistani officials, pointing fingers and levying harsh criticisms at the mountaineers. Officer Fawad Khan, who acted as a liaison between the rescue party and the National Army, wasn't shy about expressing his concerns. He had warned Elson Hargraves and Rob Slater that attempting another summit that season would be nothing short of suicidal. But despite the warnings, the team set out on August 9th, and the consequences were disastrous. The vicious windstorm claimed the lives of seven brave souls that day, leaving a tragic mark on the history of Savage Mountain, K2. It's hard not to feel a sense of sadness and grief for those who lost their lives pursuing their dreams. It's a reminder that nature is a powerful force and one that we must always respect. And that brings us to the end of the video. We hope that you found our videos informative and thought-provoking. If you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss an update from us. And remember, disasters can happen to anyone, but by coming together and sharing knowledge, we can build a safer and more resilient future. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.